Good morning. My name is Tong Ing. I'm one of the pastors here. Let me welcome you to River Life, the first service for 2018. Happy New Year. Special welcome to uh, Pastor Ryan, who uh, flew back with his dear wife from America just a couple of days ago. I greeted him, Happy New Year, and he said, flew back for the message. I looked at him, he says, your message. I love to hear you speak. Let this be the kind of thing that we do with one another, giving life and encouragement to one another. It made me so good to uh, hear him. I know he was saying it in jest, but I receive it seriously. <laughs> I want to start off by sharing a story of a middle-class Chinese family in Malaysia. The son, Ah Chong, didn't like living in his home because his father was always nagging. You are leaving the room without switching the fan off. There's nobody there. The TV is on in the room. There's no one there. Switch it off. Keep the door shut after you come out. Otherwise, the creatures may come in. Does it ring a bell? The son didn't like his father's nagging over minor things. He tolerated them until yesterday. Today, he has to go for a job interview. And he said to himself, praying for a job, praying for a job. As soon as I get this job, I will be out of the home, out of the nagging. Achong reached the interview center. There was no security. The door was half opened. He closed the door and entered the building. On both sides of the pathway, he could see beautiful flower plants. The gardener had kept the water running slowly on the hose pipe. He was nowhere to be seen, and the water was overflowing on the pathway. He moved the hose pipe near the plants and went further. There was no one in the reception area, but he saw a sign, interview, first floor, upstairs. He slowly climbed the stairs. The light that was switched on last night was still burning at 10 a.m. He remembered his father's admonition. Why are you leaving the room without switching off the lights? And he thought he could still hear that voice now. He found the switch and turned off the lights. In the large upstairs hall, he could see many nervous, smartly dressed people waiting for their turn. He saw a large number of people and they were all sitting in the few front row seats. He wondered whether he could get a job. As he walked into the room, he saw the welcome mat was upside down. He bent over, straightened up the mat with some irritation. Habits die hard. He saw all the people there, again congregated in the front. And he heard his father's voice. Why are the fans running at the back where there are no people? <laughs> it was so clear. He looked for the fan and turned the fans off. He could see many people entering the interview room and immediately leave from another door. It was so quick. There was no way anyone could guess what was being asked and what was happening in the interview room that was so quick. He went in and stood before the interviewer with some fear and trepidation. Would he be one of the quick ones? The officer took his certificates and his references from him 
and without looking at them, ask him, when can you start work? He thought, is this a trick question? <laughs> or have I been seriously offered the job? He was confused. The boss explained, we didn't ask anyone any questions here. By asking questions, we won't be able to fully assess the skills. So our test was to assess the attitude of the person. We can always teach them the skills. Our test were based on the behavior of the candidates and we observed everyone through CCTV. <laughs> no one who came today did anything to set the host pipe, the welcome mat, the uselessly running fans or lights. You were the only one who did that. That's why we have decided to select you for the job, said the boss. He always got irritated as his father's nagging about good habits. Now he realized that it was only good habits that got him his job. This morning, I've been asked to talk about the practice of prayer, the habit of good prayer life. Practice does not sound spiritual, but it is biblical. Paul in Philippians 4 verse 9 says, The things you have learned, received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Practice. Practice. Meaning to perform repeatedly. Keep doing it again and again and keep on improving on them. It gets better and better until it becomes second nature to you. It has become a habit. To pray effectively, we must have a prayer habit. To get a prayer habit, we need to practice prayer and keep on improving on it. Let's pray. Loving Father, we come to you this morning. Our minds are wandering, even as we are in this place of worship. Wandering because of many voices. Wandering because it's just us. So we ask that you help us to bring every wandering thought to the obedience of Christ. We cast any anxieties and cares on you because you love us, you care for us. So calm our minds for just these few minutes while we tune in on to you to hear your still small voice. Warm our hearts, quicken our spirit. Help us hear your still small voice that we may go forth from this place rejoicing that you have talked to us in Jesus' name. Amen. We all know the importance of prayer. It is the top priority of Jesus. He leads the crowd to pray. The disciples often find him in a lonely place in prayer. And the results, powerful deeds, powerful words, powerful Talks that the Pharisees says we have never heard someone speak with such tremendous authority and he has great peace even in the midst of storm he has peace that's a secret powerful words powerful words great peace as a result of prayer prayer yet more people feel guilty when the speaker, when the pastor speaks on prayer than any other topic. Perhaps the second topic will be evangelism. Yet we all agree with prayer, we all agree with evangelism. Yet after the message, we feel guilty. Why is that? 
the situation. You could be in the situation when the outcome of it 100% is dependent on man. In this situation, very few of us pray. On the other spectrum, you could be in the situation where the outcome 100% dependent on God. You can't do a thing, like you're drowning. God, help me! Help me, God! Even the atheists pray, <laughs> spontaneous, help me! Now, the in-between, the 0% on God to the 100% on God is your choice. It's a partnership. In prayer, you invite God into your situation. In life, we cannot control and determine every outcome. So there are many, many variables that we cannot predict. We need God. Prayer is doing life together with God who knows the end from the beginning, who has all the resources that we don't have. Let me say with great confidence that God is your perfect partner. He is your perfect complement. What you are weak in, He is strong. What you are lacking, He has. Now it's quite dumb. If you have a perfect partner, you leave Him out. So firstly then, only two parts in my message. I actually started off with four parts. Then it was too long, two parts. Firstly, develop a routine for prayer. Secondly, praying the prayer. Very easy to, re list, to remember. Habit, you need a routine. You need a routine. Uh, just like exercise, you need a routine. Now, it's easy for me because I'm an engineer by background. I, I analyze the situation and break it down into bits and find the most effective, efficient way and I keep to that. That becomes my routine. I don't have to think, I don't use any energy. My wife, on the other hand, is more artistic. She actually finds 271 different ways to wash dishes. <laughs> and sometimes, sometimes we get into conflict. And in sheer exasperation, I look at her and say, how, how could God make you so beautiful and yet so stupid? <laughs> she looked at me and said, God make me beautiful so you will marry me. God made me stupid so I will marry you. <laughs> now, now, we need both structure and creativity. We need routine and we need flexibility. But the structure needs to be there. And within the structure, you have creativity and you have flexibility. Three things needed in routine. One, duration. How long? Two, where? Three, when? Firstly then, duration. How long? The average prayer time in America is 22 minutes. 28%, more than a quarter of pastors pray less than 10 minutes a day. Now I'm saying this to release guilt in you, okay? <laughs> release guilt. Now when I was doing my doctor in ministry course in Fuller Theological Seminary, they did a survey of how much time Purposeful, block out time, where pastors and missionaries spend time in prayer. And the class average was seven minutes a day. You would expect these are the movers and shakers. They are busy, too busy to pray. They are type A. In Australia, pastor average 23 minutes a day, one minute better. In New Zealand, 30 minutes, a wee bit better. In Japan, pastors spend about 44 minutes a day. In Korea, they beat us all. 90 minutes a day. Yet the highest frustration of a pastor is the gap 
between the prayer life that they desire, that they want, and the reality of what is happening. One pastor says, like most busy people, I'm plagued by pressures, deadlines, phone calls, emergencies, and so on. Sometimes I think the devil works overtime just to keep me from praying. And never a truer statement has been uttered. The devil doesn't want you to pray. No one can succeed in God's work without prayer. That's why Peter Wagner says that these action men of God, the pastors and the missionaries, they have a poor to average prayer life. Seven minutes, very bad. But they have a good prayer cover. What he means is prayer cover is equal to your own personal prayer life plus intercessors who pray for you. But this morning, my task is not to increase your, your intercessors to pray for you, but to increase your own prayer life. So prayer, so please pray for your pastors, otherwise you are in big trouble. Somebody said, how many charismatics do you need to change a light bulb? The answer, 10. One to change the light bulb and nine to pray and cast out the spirit of darkness. <laughs> the heroes of our prayer life. John Wesley, every morning at 4 a.m. he prays for two hours. Martin Luther, I have so much to do today, I spend the first three hours in prayer or the devil will get a victory. Adoniram Judson, he prays seven times a day. Richard Foster, he wrote the book Celebration of Discipline. He says, many of us are discouraged rather than encouraged and challenged by such examples. So the key is this, is to not be idealistic, especially when you have been fired up at this time but to be realistic. Set a reasonable and realistic goal even when you're full of enthusiasm now. What is realistic for you? Five minutes? If you have no prayer habit, irregular? 10 minutes? 15 minutes? Realistic. So that there will not be constant failure. Constant failure will discourage you and you will give up. Be realistic. Is it achievable? Number two, location. Where do we pray? Jesus chose places that are free of destruction. Mark 1, Peter went looking for Jesus, almost rebuking him. Everyone is looking for you. We can't find you. You have no mobile phone. There's no reception. How are we going to get in touch with you? Almost rebuking him. Yet, there's a very purpose to get out of sight, out of touch, to spend time with God. In the Gospels, Jesus is found mostly praying outdoors in places of beauty. The mountainside, the seaside, out with nature. In Matthew 6, verse 6, Jesus taught the disciples to pray in a prayer closet. The Koreans do that in small rooms, you know. It's so small, the only movement they can do to keep themselves awake is rock forward, backward, forward, backward, you know. Most of these come back, they do that, but we got plenty of space. There's no need to do that. Susanna Wesley, she has 19 children. Of course, the most famous are John and Charles Wesley. She pulls an apron on her head wherever she is or whenever she wants to pray, signaling to her children and anyone else that she's talking to God and not to be disturbed. So, where do we pray? 
A place that you, a place where you won't be interrupted. A place that works best for you. And as you continue to pray in that place, it will become very sacred, very holy for you, full of memories, because it's in that place that the battles have been fought and victories have been won. And there are so many stories that come out of that place. Time. When do we pray? Well, early in the morning, if you had the luck, Mark chapter 1, verse 35, very early in the morning when it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place. Or at night, if at the hour, Luke 6, verse 12, Jesus went out to the mountainside, spent the night praying to God. But often when preachers talk about quiet prayer and quiet time, it's in the morning. That's why we all hours feel really guilty. All the hours try to be like lugs and fail after a while. The best time to pray is when you are at your best. If you are sleepy in the morning, that's not a very good time to have a quiet time and to pray, all right? Where you are at your best. But make it the same time each day. Don't change. We are busy people and we need routine to make it happen. That's what habit is. It is a routine. And if you miss one, don't feel guilty. All right? Don't feel guilty. Just a medication. If you miss one, it's okay. Don't, don't the next day, oh, I miss one, I do double. No need. All right? If you choose five minutes, you missed yesterday, stick to five minutes. Don't say I increase your 10 minutes. No need to do that. Okay? That will it'll be a shock to your body. Okay? <laughs> now, praying the prayer. Jesus taught only one prayer. It's often called the prayer, the Lord's prayer, the prayer of the disciples. It was first used in the upper room when the disciples were waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. Acts chapter 1, verses 13 to 14. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were the 12 disciples. Verse 14, they all joined together constantly in prayer along with the woman and Mary, the mother of Jesus, with his brothers as well. In Greek, it is te prosoke, translated the prayer. The prayer. And we all know Jesus only taught one prayer and referring to they are praying the prayer. Again, it was used after the Holy Spirit has come in Acts 2, verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. In Greek, is the article, the prayer. The prayer. Again, it was used, again, Jesus taught in Matthew as part of the Sermon on the Mount on the prayer. In Luke, it came as the disciples who could not find him, saw the effect of, his, of the power when he spent time with God. Lord, teach me how to pray. The prayer is a pattern of prayer. I'm talking about habits, routine. All right? I'm talking about structure. It is an outline or structure of prayer. Early, early last year, Andy and I were privileged to visit the Holy Land. And we visited the church, Paternoster Church. Our prayer, Pater is Father. Noster, our, Father's prayer. And in that place, there were over a hundred of our Lord's prayer written in different 
languages. I located Dusun Katazan because we are working in Borneo. I took a picture of that. I, I took a picture of the prayer in Bahasa, Malaysia. I took a picture of the prayer in, in Japanese, in Chinese, in Korean. Absolutely amazing that. And let's recite together the prayer. Let's do it together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. There are four great themes that come out from the prayer that we can use for our prayer. Firstly, our Father. Look up. Jesus brought the most powerful, the greatest revelation when he revealed that God in heaven is our Father. Now in the Old Testament, there are many names of God characterizing his character, his nature. In Genesis, Elohim, creator God. Elohim Yahweh, creator covenant God. To Abraham, when he was old of age, he was brother of a prune. And he says, yet I will make you a father of many nations. He really revealed himself as Al Shaddai, almighty God, many names. Revealing a nature, a facet of God. But Jesus revealed God as Abba Father. Abba is Aramite, the mother tongue of Jesus. Father, Greek. Abba Father is a sense of tremendous intimacy. Like dad or daddy. Or Papa, whichever way you use, in an intimate way, calling out to your Father, our Father in heaven. Romans 8, verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received of the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Your father knows everything about you. All your weaknesses, your failures, your needs, and yet he still loves you deeply. So you can tell him exactly what's in your heart. Prayer is just this, no pretense. Heart to heart. What's in your heart to him. Many of us have great trouble because what's in our heart is different to what we want to pray out, religious stuff. There is a gap. When God is your father, there's no need to pretend. Say it as it is. Don't need to mince words. One of my children will ring us regularly. Just tell it in the darkest, plainest, Think where he's at. We don't find it a burden. It doesn't upset us. But we know where he's at. And we listen. And after a while, we can sense his spirit lifts. But we have not given any advice. But he has downloaded. You see, that's the beauty. When God is above Father, you download in your heart. There's no need to pretend. When my son has a dream, bad nightmare, and when he's a kid, he doesn't call me reverend, pastor, missionary, engineer. He said, Dad! And every facet and gifts of me comes with that dad. When you call God, Father, Dad, everything comes. Almighty, 
creator, healer, everything, every facet of God comes. That's why the revelation of Jesus gives intimacy. No other revelation can bring you that intimacy. Abba, Father, encompass every revelation. Look up. Our Father, look down. Your kingdom come. Pray God's kingdom to come into our broken and troubled world, full of dishonesty, oppression, pain, suffering, corruption. We live in a messy, messy period. His kingdom is not fully come, but we pray for it to come. What's happening up there? Come down. That what's happening here may reflect what's happening up there. One day it will fully come. Revelation 11 verse 15. Then the seventh angel sounded. And there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of this world has become the kingdoms of our Lord and of Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever and ever and ever. Then we can all join in and sing Handel's Messiah. The Hallelujah Chorus. When part three, when sin and death has been overcome and Christ is totally enthroned. But we live in a messy period. His kingdom has come, but he has not totally come. That's why there's pain and suffering. That's why not everyone is healed. So Jesus was talking to the scribes and the Pharisees, and they asked him, when, 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 when will the kingdom come? And Jesus answered in Luke chapter 11, verses 20 to 21, the kingdom has come, it is within you. Within you, what is the kingdom? Romans 14 verse 7, the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. Listen, righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Spirit. In the gospel, the kingdom is characterized by supernatural powers over demons and diseases, miracles. So the kingdom is Righteousness, peace, joy, and miracles. And we can bring his kingdom to wherever we go. In the office, in the sports clubs, in the nightclubs, in the pubs, wherever we go, the kingdom is within us. Look up, our Father, look down, his kingdom has come. Look in. Give us this day our daily bread. Daily bread is not just daily sustenance, but more. In the Greek, it's something given supernaturally and continue to replenish us and does not run out. Each morning, you don't need to just pray the very limited prayer of provision. But it's more than that. It is provision for food and so on. But it's more than that. It is peace. It is His presence. It is His assurance. It is His purpose. It is His confidence. It is His stability. It is His courage for each day. And our God is the God of the overflowing, the abundance. Peter was fishing all night. Cast it on the other side. What happened? The net was breaking. Jesus performed the first miracle, converting water to wine. You know how many? Six stone jars, 120 to 180 gallons. Let me convert to you how many bottles of wine. There is over 600 to 900 bottles of wine. That's after they have had a party and ran out. He is the God of the super abundance look in abundant provision overflowing provision for whatever situation you are in forgive us our debts 
look around. That is not money collection, but our sins and our wrongdoings. We come to him as daddy, as dad, confident that he has already forgiven us our sins. That's very important. Confident that he has forgiven us our sins. My son, when he rings me, he's confident that we hold no, nothing against him. It is our legal standing. Jesus died, he has set us free. The historic death has continuing present benefits. There is no condemnation. 1 John 2 verse 12. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his namesake. And the evidence that you receive God's forgiveness is that you forgive others. Hear that? Satan now has no hold on you because you have let go. Many of you may not have heard of the monkey and the bananas and the narrow jar. Beautiful bananas inside the jar. The monkey put his hand through the narrow jar and grabbed hold of the banana. And the person came, wanted to catch a monkey. But the monkey would not let go. And so his hand is stuck. He can only let his hand out if he let go of the banana. Let go of the offense. Let go. Otherwise, Satan has got you trapped. He has set you free, but you need to let go. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who have sinned against us. The story of the prodigal father is so beautiful. He ran to the father. The father ran towards him. He ran in fear. With everything worked out what to say. The father ran towards him with tremendous joy. The father did not have to wait for him. The son did not have to say. The father embraced. He's already forgiven. Robe of righteousness, authority in the ring, celebration. Romans 5 verse 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace. This is active voice. Let me tell you the difference. If I go to Ryan, I say, I take your pen. That's active. I take your pen. If Ryan says, Tong, I give you my pen. That's passive voice. You have been forgiven. Peace is yours. You go, take it. You have no peace, it's given to you. You've been set free. You take the peace. Look up, our Father. Look down, your kingdom come. Righteousness, love, joy. Miracles. Look in. Abundant provision for every situation. Look around. He set you free. He set you free. Let us pray. Loving Father, you are absolutely fantastic. You are our Father. While we are in prayer, all heads bowed, all eyes closed. There any one of you who do not know God as our Father. Jesus has died for us, paid the full penalty of our sins. We can call him 
our Father. And this morning you are here, not by chance. You have been asking God to speak to you. And this morning, God has spoken to you. He says, I love you. I died for you. I want to be your daddy. I want to be your father. You want to open your heart to him and receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Will you please put your hand up and I love to pray for you. Anyone at all, put your hand right up. Want to know God as Father? Put your hand right up so I can see you. Anyone at all? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Anyone more? Put your hand right up. Thank you, I see that. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Loving Father, I pray now, Lord Jesus, that there will be great rejoicing. I pray, Father, that you run towards these people. Give them a hug. Give them a hug that your spirit will witness with your spirit the children of the living God. And 2018 will never, never be better because you are our Father. You can look up and call on your kingdom to come, bringing to wherever we go righteousness, love, joy, and signs and wonders and miracles because you are with us. And to you be all the glory. Amen.